Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It's a little bit more full in here this morning than it was last week, and that's a good thing. <laughs> so don't worry, it's cool. All right, if you're new here, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor, and I have a question that you don't have to answer out loud. But I wonder how many other people here have been lost as a kid? And I've talked about this in the past. It happened to me as a kid when my mom would be shopping. We talked about her in the past. She finds the clearance rack so she can win Christmas, right? So she goes to the clearance bin or the clearance rack and forgets everything else in the world, right? So there's just nothing else, including your child, going on. At the same time, I could be under, and I don't know, like if they call them this anymore, the rounders. Right? They were like a magical hiding place, like where you go under the rounder and you'd have a pre-made tent. It's great, right? So as long as you can see your mom's feet, you think you're okay. Or the toy aisle, where there are all the things, because they're not on sale. They're the things that I'm not going to be getting. I'm not going to be playing with these things. So here's what I decide. I can have playtime right here in the aisle with the toys. So that's what I do. And right, as long as you think you can see your parent's leg, you're good, right? So here's what happens. You know, you do the leg check. Either, you know, you got it in the peripheral, you touch it. It's okay. You go back to your playing, you touch it, and then eventually here's what happens. You touch a leg, and you hear, are you lost? And panic sets in, right? So the deep breathing, and it goes gradually, right? Mom? 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 And the change is, mommy! You know, right? So you're screaming, right? What's going on? So here's the thing. If one of your little ones, if you have them, touches my leg, you may have heard or hear something like this. I'm not your dad. <laughs> Immediately, right? So law enforcement, they know why I'm doing that, right? Because we don't have any time to lose. Wake up. Wake up. Let's go. I have some questions here. We need to get through them. I don't have time for mommy, mommy, mommy or any deep breathing. We got to go. We got to find your mom. Also, here's what happens. Your child, if I've done this to you, has immediately found you. That's what happens. They're like, whoa, you know what I mean? Like, I'm getting out of there. So it works, right? So we don't have time for any of this stuff. It works. It's not rude. So on the other side, here's what you have going on. My mom in the clearance bin. So she's in there, and there's just nothing else in the world. And here's what she finds. An untagged toy. A toy without a tag on it. But it's a new one, and she knows it, right? So she's going to game the system. She gets the sales associate, come on over here. This doesn't have a tag on it. You know, you need to mark it clearance. Well, let me check, right? So she goes and checks, comes back, no, ma'am. It was just in the clearance bin by accident. Well, now the argument starts, right? Well, get a manager. That doesn't work, right? It's in, it's in clearance. That's clearance. That's it. And they're like, no, that's not the way it works, ma'am. And this becomes, she's not going to win. It becomes sobering. Sobering enough to realize she has a kid. Then she goes through the cycles, right? Like in my case, like Gene, Gene, you know, it's the sing songy thing, Gene, and then it changes too. Genie, you know, it's like my little baby name. She starts, my son, right? So then the good Samaritan <laughs> hears this and goes, ah, you see why I did that? I got it quiet enough because if you're doing the mommy thing, we might not have heard this here. This is your mom. And then here's the process of the emotions. You had the panic going on, and there's this brief stint of gratitude the good Samaritan, but that goes away really quick, right? So thank you so much. And then it goes to anger, right? Anger. You get real low and you're like, you didn't I tell you away from me. So she's yelling at you with her face, right? <laughs> so they already know I'm a bad parent. They don't have to know I'm a really, really bad parent. Come with me. And so <laughs> it's me in there, picks you up right now. I've got mom strength. And so there I am with the toy and I drop it right in the clearance bin. That's how that got there. Right there. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> it's all your fault. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. So, welcome to Southwest Florida. If you're new, I'll tell you about a little something. Um, we don't just lose our little people here. We lose our old people here. <laughs> it's a real thing. And I'll tell you about something. It took me a little while. I'll rip this Band-Aid right off. You don't even have to have this conversation in the car. So, I was on the highway, and I saw this sign. It's like one of those signs that you can change. I don't know where the computers that change them are, but they change them, right? And so it says silver alert. And then there's a description of a car. And so at first I'm thinking, wow, they're like crime-fighting geniuses here in Florida, right? If someone steals a car, 
And then we're all on the lookout for a stolen car. I'm looking around. I'm thinking, wait a minute. What does this really mean? And so I looked it up. I'll be honest. I looked it up, Silver Alert, and I'll be honest about something else. All right, so we're going to talk about the sinful nature. I laughed. I laughed. I thought it was funny. I was like, <laughs> they lose their whole people. <laughs> like, this is so funny. Sharon, my wife, do you know what that is? No, you don't. So we're talking about it, and I'm like, okay, but hold on. Hold on. So we lost an old person, and it's just a description of the car they may or may not be driving. What if they ditched the car? It doesn't make sense. So, of course, I'm going to fix the whole system. All right, so here's what I do. I'm like, okay, we need a description of the person. And so I start going through it, right? And I'm like, okay, male, female, that would be nice. All right, gray hair, silver alert. So there we go, right? Uh, <laughs> comfy shoes. You know what I mean? That's, that's good. Comfy shoes. Uh, and then we got like something like, uh, you know, because it's cold in Florida, so you got a sweatsuit or members-only jacket. Oh, that's why they didn't do it, because they all look the same. So anyway, <laughs> back to the car. Right, so here's the funny thing. This is like talking about sin. And so he's like, oh, my gosh, he talked about old people. He's going to offend people. Nope, that's not the way it works. Preaching secret, one-on-one. The person who's old is always thinking about someone older than them. That's the thing. So, right, when sin, right, you're going to start thinking about someone who does that more than you. At least I'm not that bad. Heather talked about that last week. Don't go there, right? You're old. So, anyway. (laughs) Anyway, so here's what we know. Here's what we know. We know the person is old. They don't know where they're going. They're lost. They don't know where they're going. But they're getting there really fast. Welcome to Naples. (laughs) isn't it like that on the roads so here's the thing I don't think all of them are really lost because here's the thing I've experienced with this before they called them silver alerts Uh, we lost my grandfather one time at least uh, we thought so right so everyone's calling you know know, have you seen him you see him they're all worried all day long everybody's calling they're panicking they're looking around for him all stuff he comes home later and now my grandmother right the anger like where are you all this stuff and he's like I was not lost it was at the movies to get away from her, right? So, that, <laughs> so if your old person is lost, calm, remain calm, all right? So they may just be, they need some time away from you all. That's what it is. <laughs> all right, so that was my long way of getting to Jesus going missing. That's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus went missing at one point, and that's what we're going to look at in these accounts. And so here's the other thing. Everybody who's been here for a long time, they're like, oh, that was a long joke. This is going to be a hard message. That's, so you know how that works. It's okay. We'll survive. We'll get there. Just don't be too mad at me. Be mad at God because that's what I'm just quoting the scriptures. All right. So, <laughs> so here we go. We are at, we talked about, well, Skipped over, so a Christmas time message, the birth account of Jesus, the genealogies, and it led to, no matter where you've come from, you are welcome in the family of Jesus. That was the point. Heather kind of shared her testimony and elaborated on that point. If you know her story, definitely, right? So you're all welcome here, no matter where you're at in that whole thing, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, good. You found the right place. That was the point. So we're back in the rest of the story. This is our series. And we've learned that the Bible is not in chronological order. So I kind of put it back together for you with a chart. And here we go. So we have to hop around a little bit. Matthew is the first gospel, but there are parts of Luke that are kind of here and there. And so you see this part of Matthew here. It goes right in between these two sections of Luke if you're doing it chronologically. So what's kind of cool is today is the 8th. And right here in the Word of God, it is eight days later. So kind of neat when that works out. We'll start right in Luke 2, 21. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So here's the thing. I put that quote up there, and 
if you look before it, uh, it actually says the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb. Or, and then if a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb, she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So this gives us a little insight, and it's just a place where I can show you again, really good to know the Old Testament to a third of the New Testament is Old Testament quotation like we see here. And then you get a little background. What if she can't afford the lamb? So this speaks volumes about our Lord. So, right, he decides, all right, I'm going to come in human form. I'm God. I'm going to come in human form, right? So what's he going to do? I'm going to set myself up with a rich family in a mansion. No. Poor people, they can't afford the sacrifice offering. Wow. Talk about humility. Right? So this is how he comes. So it gives us a better picture of Jesus. So now in the account, I'll just mention a few people. Um, we have Simeon and Anna. And so, again, I was mentioning that you see the Holy Spirit alive and active, right, in the beginning of these gospel accounts. And so Simeon is actually being led by the Spirit. He's being told by God that you won't die before you've seen the Messiah. Leads him into the temple area, and there's Jesus. So now, you know, basically, I can die. I've seen the Messiah. So he's blessing the babies, blessing Jesus, and he blesses the parents. He gives Mary some kind of not so good news. And then there's Anna, the prophetess, too. So she's prophesying during this time. Really interesting. So now, if we go back to the chart, I want to point some things out. I've already ruined Christmas for you guys, so we're not going to talk too much about the Magi. <laughs> but... Uh, there's a reason why we don't sing We Three Kings, right? Because they're, they're not kings. Only two kings in this account, King Jesus and evil King Herod. So basically what happens is, is these magi in Greek, if you are looking at Greek and you do a translator, it'll say magicians. So like astronomers, magicians, something like that. And so they end up in Jerusalem and they're like, where's the Messiah at? And people start freaking out, especially King Herod. He doesn't need another king right, to take over. So they're searching the scriptures. Ah, Micah 5 2. That's where it is. He'll be born in Bethlehem. Herod's like, go there. When you find him, come back and tell me because I want to worship him too. Bing. So he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> he wants to kill him. So they get there. <clears throat> they find him again. It's different now. So why do they put it at a different timeline? Well, we got a couple of clues here. So when we're dealing with the shepherds and the angels, he's in a manger, right? No room in the inn and the manger. Here, you should immediately pick up on something if you're a careful reader. They arrive at the house. It's a house. And if you read it in the Greek, house. It's exactly that, a house. But if you're also reading the Greek, some things aren't so obvious in the English depending on your translation. Shepherds and angels, it's the word for a newborn baby. It's not even child. or It's like brand new born, like it just got born. That, that's the word that's used there. Here, <clears throat> it's calling him a child. So it changes there. So the other thing is Herod, so they take off, they escape, the Magi, they don't go back to Herod, they're warned. And so now Herod gets really upset. He's been duped. And so he has all the kids in that area, two years old and younger, killed. Why two years old? And that's why some people say this is up to two years later. Could be. Maybe he's just hedging his bets. But we know it's not that same day. Right? So it's just later on this whole thing happens. So we see they escape to Egypt. They're worried about this. Then they come back. It fulfills some prophecy here. I think Hosea 11, 1, they, they come back to Nazareth. So I called my son out of Egypt. So it's like this fulfillment of Moses going on here. So now... About 10 years later in the chart, we can go to Luke 2.41. So all that happened right there in between these two accounts in that chapter of Luke. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind under the toy rack, right, or the, the, the <laughs> clothing rack. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. 
Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him. So maybe she was like that. Why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house or if you're doing it more literally, involved with my father's affairs. But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all his people. So this gets noted a couple times right at the beginning here, if you're reading the whole thing. Jesus grew in wisdom. Wisdom's a really big thing here. And if you remember, John the Baptist, like the Messiah's herald, we're going to talk about him later. So he's going to make people obedient to the wisdom of the righteous, it says about him. So this all kind of connects there. Jesus is wise. We are supposed to be wise as Christian. So here we see that Jesus went missing as a boy. What we also see in today's accounts are cycles of people finding Jesus. So we can draw right from the shepherds. Found Jesus. Magi found Jesus. And so we have Simeon, expectantly. He finds Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Anna finds Jesus. Jesus' parents find Jesus. Common denominator here, huh? So the natural question is, have we found Jesus? What does that mean? Have you found Jesus? Now, we're going to kind of examine this a little bit today. And we're going to kind of ask some questions here. How do we know? How do we know if someone has found Jesus? Well, luckily, Jesus tells us. So let's look. Luke 6.43. If we jump ahead in Luke, we're going to take a look real quick. Jesus is speaking. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So here, I'm going to just kind of hop over to Matthew. Could be the same, and it's recorded a little bit differently maybe two different sermons. So preachers would go in a circuit. Jesus is kind of like on a preaching circuit here, and they'll often preach like the same variation on a sermon, something like that. So here we have this is in the Sermon on the Mount. That was in the Sermon on the Plain. It's called, so Matthew 7, 17. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. If we go back to Luke, right on here's people like, oh, you know, I heard it. It's okay, just stay with me. <laughs> so Jesus says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? He's saying, if you know me, why aren't you bearing good fruit? That's the question when you put all this together here. We are to judge a tree by its fruit. So it's like that thing earlier in Matthew. Remember Matthew 7, 1, don't judge. And then people go, and they just scribble everything out, right? But, but judge. <laughs> so it's a little bit of both. So quick, quickly, quickly on this, right? So in a church context, you're supposed to discern, right? You're supposed to know. Like who the people may be, you know, careful around, you know. But the pastor's job, that's the one who's, who is to judge, right, in that sense. And then have the talk with that person or whatever. If they sin directly against you, you go talk it out. That's okay. Don't gossip or tattletale. So that's, that's kind of the thing here. So it's a little of both. Don't be judgy, 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 right? But there's a time and place to judge. Read 
1 Corinthians 5. <laughs> he says, we do judge those inside the church. Important. So here we see, again, that point being made by Jesus. You judge a tree by its fruit. Yes, <laughs> you judge. So here's the thing, though. <clears throat> We're going to be judged by our fruit. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to, like, holster the fingers. Some say we're going to turn around on us. We're going to put a mirror up. And we're going to look into that mirror today. Because here's what Jesus says right before that. <laughs> Luke 6, 41. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye. When you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. You see what he's doing here? Mm -hmm. well, examine yourself. And this is what the Bible says. And here's what happens a lot in Christianity. And if you're new here, you're going to learn a lot about the attitude of this church. Right? So Jesus hands us a mirror. Right? So, like, this is kind of the picture of what we're getting here. Jesus goes, here you go. Here's a mirror. Right? And so what do you think we're supposed to do with a mirror? We're supposed to look into it, right? Why? To get, like, the logs out of our eyes, right? So well, just, look, just concentrate. You focus on you. You just do that, right? Get that straight. Now, what do a lot of Christians do? If I was up here on the stage with a mirror, I should have done it. It would have been a good illustration, right? Turn, they turn it around. They start shine in the light in other people's eyes. Correct? Yeah. A lot of that. So quick, I, I just can't resist, right? So when I was a kid, I had a, like a watch, and I was really bad in math, really bad in school. So I was in math class, and I had the watch on, and I noticed that it reflected the light into my teacher's eye. And I did it until he lost his mind <laughs> and kicked me out of the class. Anyway, don't do that. But so <laughs> don't be me before Jesus. <laughs> yeah. uh, antagonist. <laughs> so, but this is what we do, right? I had to break that up because it was getting really serious there for a minute. So this is what they do. <laughs> no, we need to use our mirrors to reflect, not deflect. Reflect not deflect. No deflection today. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep it on us, right? Stay in the lane. So the Bible calls us to examine ourselves. One such place, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. This is what is being said here. Test yourselves to see if you found Jesus. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? So, this is it. So, the test. And there's another question I've been asked, so I'm glad to answer it. How? Well, we saw it. Judge a tree by its fruit. But we can do so with scriptures. And so that's what I'm going to do today. We're going to kind of do an interesting Galatians spirituality test. I'm going to use scriptures to make this point. I'm going to show you both sides of it here, and then we'll all get through this together, right? So first, let's look at the flesh. This is a concept you have to understand. The flesh versus the spirit. Important. So scriptures, Galatians 5, 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Two different things. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. So you see the concept here. We have a sinful nature. It's in all of us. We're just born with it. And so the Holy Spirit helps clean it out. Like that's kind of the key. So this is what's going on here. So <clears throat> it's letting the Holy Spirit guide our lives. This is key. Like Simeon, right? Guided him to Jesus. So we're provided with some evidence here. And so if we keep reading, here's <clears throat> what goes on. Galatians 5.19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and 
other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I've said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God, the other side. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, patience, peace, sorry, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Why he says that context is about following the law. He's trying to get them to stop doing that. You don't need to do that. We're in Christ now. So that's why that's there. But you get the point. So here's what I did. And I want to kind of listen. We're going to do kind of a self-examination. We're going to start the year with the self-examination. We're going to examine ourselves. And here's a couple things. Do not worry. Remain calm. <laughs> because every living human being has done one of the bad things in the first part. Or maybe all of them. That's our sinful, what does it say? Nature. Right? So more literal, like the sins of the flesh. Well, why does it say that? Why does it get translated nature? Flesh, right? It's a part of your human makeup. Like that's not... That, but who you are, right? It's a part of just who human beings are. So the first thing that I want to do walking into this is to say to all of you that, the, I guess the bad column, which way is it for you? On the right, I've done all that, all right? I've done all that. And I can struggle at times with some of that, all right? So it's not, it's not like I hate this, like, like he's talking about me. You know, it's like, Listen, I was not thinking of you as I prepared this sermon. <laughs> Don't do that. I sit with God, and he tells me what we should be working on. But I thought about you after I prepared the sermon. So, <laughs> just saying. But anyway, uh, so done all that. <clears throat> Struggle with some of that, right? As I walk more and more with the Lord, less and less of that. And so this is the point. It's not to say... You know, you're done. Like, you check that stuff out. That's not the point. So let's just identify some of these things. In identifying them, you, you know, if you're like some kind of English major, you might be looking at it and going, well, that's not the exact definition of that word. No, that's not the point. That's why people don't understand things, because of people like you. So <laughs> I'm trying to make it easy to understand. Do we understand this? Like, so it's just really easy to understand. So I'm going to make this as uncomplicated as possible for you. So love, here's the thing. And also, it's also, you're, 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 you're cross-referencing it with like the biblical meaning of it as well, right? So it's not just Merriam-Webster or whatever it is. It's, you you got to look at the Bible and how to understand these things as Christians. So when we look at love, love is living, it's yes, affection, yes, right? But what comes with that? Living sacrificially for others. Right? So it could be little things, let someone in front of you in the line, right? whatever it is, especially if they have crazy kids, or whatever, go ahead. Right? So you know, showing love, sacrificial. It could be big things, and Jesus says, right? No greater love than this, that someone would die for somebody else. Big things. So the main thing within all that is it's unconditional relational love, not transactional. So the world, everything's transactional. According to the word, it's not. Right? So the world and the worldly person will use terms like, that's not fair. <laughs> right. Jesus getting crucified, not fair. And so you begin there. Right? So you've got to flip the thinking. It's not transactional. This means you do this much to me, I do that much back to you. Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? No, no. No, you just take it, all right? Love, even your enemies, even those persecuting you. Love, unconditional, not trans. So that's the thinking, right? We need to get our thinking not transactional. It's not about that. It's unconditional. And that's the way Jesus loves. So the first thing you got to do is you think about that. Right? So, and this is a good exercise. Think, put this in the front of your mind. Jesus, God, Right? Remember, he came into that poor family, and then he got crucified for you. God died a horrible death for you. Nothing equitable about that. Not, nothing fair. There's nothing fair about that. Okay? There's no, that's it. <laughs> it's like, okay. 
Start there. All right? So bring yourself to that's base. Like, stay there. All right? Keep that thought in your head as I go through these. Joy, happiness, like a sense of well-being. But here's the thing. For a Christian, it's different. It's in all situations. You got to read the rest of these letters, right? Have joy always. <laughs> Some of these people are in prison. They're suffering persecution. Their families are dying. Like, it's not a good situation in the New Testament for these people. But I consider it all joy. Hebrews 10. Read that. When you had everything taken away from you, you considered it all joy. Because you know there are better things waiting for you in heaven. If you don't believe me, Hebrews 10. Write it down. Joy. Peace. Same kind of thing. Are you at peace with that? Contentment. That's a, that's a word. Contentment. You don't, you don't hear that right in the world a lot. You just need to be content. <laughs> like all these kind of like prosperity teachers, you know, motivational speeches. You, know, you need to get more. Very little of like, wow. <laughs> Especially in Naples. Come on, let's be real here. You know, this is amazing that I have all this stuff. I really don't even need to bother striving for more because look at all those poor people in other countries or <laughs> right down the road living in the woods. Patience, the ability to accept all this suffering without getting angry or upset if you really are suffering. And that's the funny thing. I see so many people who identify as Christians, you know, they, they like place themselves as if they're being persecuted somehow. And I talk to missionaries and they're like, like really? That's persecution? But it might happen. It hasn't. <laughs> Calm down. Patience. Don't get angry or upset. Kindness. Again, it's just an extension. Paul is kind of like this linear thinking here. Kindness, being kind to people. Consider it. I like that word, right? Consider it. Generous. Here, you first. Goodness. All goes in there. Virtuous. Faithfulness. Remaining loyal and steadfast, I would add, especially when no one is looking. Faithfulness. Gentleness, mild-mannered and tender, mild-mannered, calm, self-control. That's a tough one. Nobody likes that over everything you're doing in your life. Self-control. I won't elaborate. I've done that in the past. Three less emails. Okay. <laughs> You know what I mean? So let's go to the other bad column here. You're like, I thought it was already bad. Right? So uh, sexual immorality. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to say about this. And this is the, uh, so this is the mirror thing, like, big time. Just get your mirror and keep looking at it. Don't peek over the mirror. Nothing. Don't turn it around. Just look at your own self in this mirror. Because this is what happens. This is what we do not do here. It's none. It would just be very clear about something. None of the sexual sin is okay, the way the Bible defines it, all right? So this is what we believe here at C3 Church, marriage between a man and a woman. That's what we believe. That is what the Bible says. That's it. Okay. <laughs> but when you read lists like 1 Corinthians 6, and there's like this list of all this stuff among like different specific sexual sins, there's like a whole bunch of other ones in there too, right? And so usually the people going ah, la, 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 about a specific sexual sin are guilty of some of those other ones. Keep looking into the mirror. Keep looking into the mirror. Stop it. That's what the church needs to hear. All Christians need to hear. Stop it. Stop it. Jesus said it. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. Stop it. Right, because here's, I've seen this happen. A pastor who's clearly guilty of not having some of those other things. And the other column, bah, 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 one specific sexual sin. And they go home and they look at porn. Uh-huh. What does Jesus say? If you so much as look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Keep the mirror up. So that's why I don't, because people approach me about that, right? Like, are you too liberal? Like, stop it. <laughs> right? Because I can start talking about yours. Right? So that's why I do that. Because, no, every, again, 
Everyone is welcome here. I do care, but you understand my heart when I say this. I don't care with the exact specific. I'm not going to pick on your exact specific sin. All right? We are all guilty. We all need to get better. So everybody's welcome here. That's what everybody needs here. So don't pick your favorites. Idolatry, sorcery, trusting in people are things, and you're like, that's not the little, just this is the idea, right? So if we did sorcery, right, we're trying to cast a spell, or maybe you got a Ouija board, maybe you do, you know, actually modern day, the uh, astrology, is that what, the astrology stuff, right? So what are you trusting in? Why are you doing that? The root of it is you don't trust God. Go to the Word of God. You have everything right there. And just trust, right? So that's it. Why are you doing that? And it could be people or things or institutions. That's idolatry. It could be a pastor. Don't trust in me. <laughs> I'm just a humble servant who will die. That's it. I am nobody. So pastor worship. That's another thing people do. Politicians, different things. No, 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 no. All of our trust must be in God alone. It's funny. It's on our money, right? <laughs> but we don't even realize that. So that's idolatry. Hostility. Now, so I'm going to kind of couple these two, the quarreling and the hostility. I'm going to get over that. So belligerence, if you don't know what belligerence means, it's being warlike, wanting a fight. You are looking for a fight, and you'll find some way to get there, right? So passive aggressiveness is a big way we get a fight when we want it. And so we're going to post something that we know, like, you know, whatever, your mom isn't going to like, right? <laughs> I wasn't doing that with a toy. She doesn't talk to me, right? So anyway, <laughs> so, right, but you know you're going to slip something in there and you're going to ignite the internet, right? So that's what you're looking to do. This hostility, bullying, unfriendliness, opposition, quarreling leads to these things. The quarreling, the disagreements, constantly, duck, 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 instead of going back to the other column and going, fine. You know what I mean? Like, that's great. You believe that? I'll believe this. I told you the truth. As the Bible says, the blood is not on my hands. That's it. I'm out. I'm going to argue with you about it. I'll let the Holy Spirit, right? So we're better. We're better lawyers than the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be better to use some of the other stuff in the other column to get them to Jesus, right? Make that introduction and, like, let him do the work? That, right? Jealousy, envy. This is why a lot of those things happen if we're being real. Jealousy, envy. You're jealous. We call it a hater. Right? You're just a hater. That's all. <laughs> You're just a hater. You You're a hater. Stop it. Is that still like modern language? I'm going back like 20 years. People use that? All right. Cool. It's like my daughter's like. <laughs> so old. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this one's kind of outbursts of anger. This is a funny one. I'm, I'm just going to go over a couple quick things. People, here's the thing. If you have not read the Bible cover to cover and you don't do that constantly, please do not pluck out a scripture and try to argue with me about it. Like, just don't do that. It's not good. <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's what they do. They go, I'm angry and I'm allowed to do it because Jesus got angry and cleared the temple. <laughs> Making me angry, right? So no, 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 no. That's it. Right, now move on. No. So anyway, it's wrong, right? So here's a couple of things. And when a person, it's so, uh, what's the word? Like revealing. You've revealed yourself if you've done that. You've revealed a couple of things about you. Two main things. You don't know the word of God at all. And you are not God, but you think you are. Because Jesus was fulfilling scripture. That's not you. That is not you. And Jesus has something we don't really, righteous indignation. There's no righteous, because if you kept reading beyond that, you'd read James 1.20, which said the anger, literally wrath in the Greek of man, does not produce the righteousness of God. Ephesians 4.26, I can keep going all day long. What does that say? Be angry, but do not sin. Ah! If you keep being angry, it is sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 27, why? Because you're going to give the devil a foothold. You've opened the door. Ah, I'm here. That's what it does. When you get angry, you're just giving the devil an opportunity now. So that's that. Anger, right here, outburst of anger. It's a sin. It's in the sin column, period. That's what the Word of God says. 
what translation is that? All of them, right? <laughs> all of them. They all say, I'm telling you, spring. <laughs> all right, now here's an interesting one. I want to connect two together because it's like kind of a, it could be a house, like selfish ambition. A lot of people struggle with this. What is that? Should I get a promotion at work? That's not what it's really talking about. Like, go ahead, get a promotion at church, tithe it. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with making money. We need our benefactors. It's fine. That's okay. Selfish ambition is a different thing. Selfish ambition is like literally when you're stepping over other people. Right? So when you're thinking to yourself so much that you're, 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 it's hurting other people. So this happens all the time, not just like work, family. It's happened in my family. You know, my dad had some selfish ambition, but nobody else in the family wanted to go where he was going and do what he did, but he did it anyway. So that happens. That's the thing. But here's something kind of funny. This happens in, it's not funny, actually. It happens in church. And so I'm going to give you a red flag, selfish ambition. It's really funny. If you hear somebody going around saying, my ministry, my ministry, eh, run. Run or help, help me kick them out of the church. My ministry. Hey, my, and those of you who have been here for a while, you know why. You know why it's really dangerous. My ministry. Listen, there, you don't, it's the church's ministry. It's Jesus' ministry. Belongs to him. Again, I will die. My only objective here, I want to teach you guys, get you more knowledgeable about the word of God, right? shepherd you when you need me. And train someone else to be here who can hopefully do it better than me. That's it. I'm praying for my Timothy. I am dust. This is not my ministry. So here's what happens. Someone will come in and they'll ask me a question like this, wrong question. How long does it take to become a pastor? And I'm like, it's like a martial arts background, right? Did it for a long time. When someone would come in and say, how long does it take to get a black belt? It took me 10 years. <laughs> how long does it take? I'd be like, you're never going to get it because you just failed the first test. How long does it take to become? You just failed the first test. It's not a job anybody in their right mind should want. It's not a job. It's a calling. And so if you have not been called, you're not it. You don't apply. <laughs> it's a calling. A calling. God anoints you and ordains you to do it. It's not up to me or anybody else. What I'm going to do is say, all right, let me pray. No, because you asked the wrong question. Short prayer. But then what that person does, and I've seen it, some of you guys have seen it, they'll turn around and start their ministry. Right? They'll start their ministry, a way of making them somebody. They're going to listen to me. And then their ministry will start occurring more and more apart from what the church wants to do. Well, that's interesting. And then they start creating the next one, dissension and division. That's how divide happens. I'm going to say something. It's going to be kind of unusual to a lot of people. And again, don't look at like one example. Look at the full context of God's word in the New Testament after the formation of the church in Acts. Right? So go Acts through. You do not see. You do not see missions or any ministries outside of the authority and blessing of the church. Think about that. I know a lot of ministry organizations that are not attached or blessed or under the authority of any particular church. They're just going through all the churches, right, trying to parasite off them. That's what they do. But they're un under no authority at all. And that's how that happens. So be very careful. Be very careful. Everything is through the Lord, through his godly leadership, who have passed that test. It's really important understand that. So that happens here, and it's worth noting. Watch out for the people that say, my ministry. Oof. We are slaves of Christ. That's what it says in the Greek. Slaves, we are bound to him. Drunkenness, intoxication, I'll leave you alone. We did that last week. So <laughs> Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Again, the Spirit will lead us to Jesus. This is how we know we've found him. 
And so two things, I kind of covered this a little bit, so it'll be super, really quick. Personal, right? So this is a self-evaluation. By the way, it's in the apps. You can see Three Naples, wherever you get your apps, you'll see the blue logo, our logo there, and then you can go, I think it is a, like, its own thing, spiritual evaluation. And if it's not, it's in the Bible study questions. Media, not so obvious, like a picture of a camera, everything's pictures. A picture of a camera and then Bible study questions, and it's in there. I think I put the chart in there at the bottom. That's how you look at it. Anyway, so first thing, self-evaluation. Spouses, don't look at your spouses. Friends, don't look at your friends. It's not for you to be better or worse than anybody else. This is yours. Don't say, what did you get? You know, like, <laughs> no, just you. You focus on, like I said, I'm still learning this. It's been 20 years, right? So <laughs> I'm still learning this. Like, none of my business. None of my business. Like, <laughs> just, you, you can be like, yes, none of my business. There's my business, none of my business. My business, none of my business. Just mind your own business. Fix yourself. And men, men, husbands, you lead by example. That's how you do it. Not like this. It's just, I'm telling you, 20 years. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just do. Just do. Just do. Just do. That's it. All right? So don't get in each other's tests. I don't want to hear about any of that. Again, it's phone call. Here's what I'm going to get. Pastor, we need a meeting. You know, it's <laughs> no, you don't. You looked at each other's tests. And that's another thing. Stop looking in your spouse's phone. Stop, you know, like anyway. So uh, the other thing here, don't. Panic. Remain calm. Because I know some of y'all are going to look at it and be like, I'm not a Christian, you know, right? So, like, no, it's not what that means. Just remain calm. Like, you may, like I said, like, I've been guilty of all of the ones in the bad column. Like, just, you may have some in there, right? It's okay. Like, but here's the thing. Here's what I want to say, and we're, we're going to close soon. I was going to say, even if you've checked off most of the boxes, right? You know, you, no, I'm going to change that. Change it. I'm going to say this. Especially, hear this, especially, I spit when I say that. I know, sorry. I only got my wife. So, <laughs> especially if you have checked off all of the ones in the sin column. Do you hear what I'm saying? Especially if you have checked off all of the ones on the sin column. You are welcome here because you are right where you need to be. You are welcome here. So this is not hearing my heart. This is not a, you know, like I'm not taking this. And No, no, no. All right? We cannot recognize it, right, until we acknowledge it. That's all. Where am I having problems? And what we're going to do, we're going to lead into how to start working on those things. I'm not just going to leave you with this. I just, just do this. Go do this in your own time, not here. Just go do it. Think about it. Pray about it. And next part of this series, I'm going to start work. We're going to start working on it. It's a thing, fancy word, words, progressive sanctification. The idea is that, you know, you're saved, you know Jesus. Then as you go along, the Holy Spirit works on you and cleans some of this stuff out as you realize it. But here's the thing. You have to realize it. You have to acknowledge it. Like, there's no problem. Well, then you're never going to fix that problem. All right, so we can't go around like that. There's no problem. There's a problem. So what is the problem? Like, what's going on? Let's identify it. Get a little score there. And just, just keep it perfect. Don't even share with your spouse. None of your, none of your business. All right? So focus there. So has someone found Jesus? Look, the thing is, if they're saying so, maybe. But we got to look at the fruit. And this fruit gives us the indicator. And so we may we have found him, we may have met him, but do we know him? Do we know him? Is he your Lord yet? So you've been introduced to Jesus, right? You may have met Jesus. Hi, nice to meet you, Jesus, and then we'll walk away. If you're saying you are in a relationship, a committed relationship with Jesus, then it's different. So here are the differences. All right? So we're all in different places in this walk. That's fine. And if we, as Christians who consider ourselves mature, what are we supposed to have? 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, right? So we're supposed to have patience, right? Help. We're here to help. No judgy, judgy. We're here to help. So this is what we want to work on. It's all about relationship, but we must first examine ourselves. Faith comes through hearing, Romans 10. Faith comes through hearing. But now once it's here, we want to try to get it to make the journey here. Well, that's what it's all about. From hearing to hearts, let's examine ourselves this week, as we're told to do. Then we'll take a closer look at that relationship with the one we have found. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for everyone in the hearing of my voice. I thank all these people for coming on in here, for using this time. Time is valuable. Coming in here to hear the word of God to commit themselves to you. Lord, I pray that they continue this process, not just in this time, but they take it with them. Furthermore, that they act as vessels of your grace, your mercy, your peace, your love, so that you may be made known, magnified and glorified. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.